Looks like we're live, Nellie. We're live. Yep, we're live. Uh, thank you. Okay, so welcome everyone. It's April 30th, hard to believe, last day of April. And this is a joint meeting between House Healthcare and Senate Health and Welfare. And we're continuing our work uh, this morning uh, looking at um, access to care for uninsured and especially those who are farm workers um, and migrant workers. So uh, we, um, a, little, a little glitch in our, um, a little glitch in the proposed agenda that you might have looked at earlier. And that is Addie Stromolo of DIVA will not be able to be here today to, to talk about uh, Medicaid issues. And so uh, we'll, we'll look at our schedule for next week and, and have her come in next week sometime. Um, so we won't miss out on that testimony. Addie did send in a PowerPoint. And so you can look that through and that'll give you an inkling of what uh, is going on and then be able to ask some uh, questions as we move forward on possible legislation. So, um, that's it. Uh, and today we have Devin Green of the Vermont um, Hospitals. And Devin, welcome. Thank you for being here. And I see that we do have testimony from you on our webpage. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so I heard about this testimony um, in terms of questions around farm workers and their access to COVID-19 uh, treatment, including farm workers who um, may be working here, um, but whose residency is in another country. Um, and I did want to point to a program that just came out on Monday. We had heard that this was going to happen, um, but we did not have the details around it. Um, but this is, uh, so basically when Congress was passing their various bills to deal with COVID-19, they covered the testing for COVID-19 for uninsured folks, but they did not um, say anything specific about the treatment of people with COVID-19. Um, the Trump administration, and I think was um, a response to the pushback that they received for not opening up the special enrollment period, uh, said that they would uh, provide coverage for uh, uninsured folks uh, for COVID-19 treatment. Uh, they'll be using the coverage that they'll be providing will come out of that 100 billion, now 175 billion uh, provider emergency fund. So uh, they'll be using that to pay for the coverage and the cost of treating individuals without healthcare coverage is estimated to be between 14 billion and 42 billion. Uh, so, we still don't know all the details of how this plan is going to work, but uh, folks uh, were getting trained yesterday and I think they're getting trained tomorrow on it. And we've notified all our hospitals about it. Uh, the eligibility as far as we can see right now is uninsured individuals with a COVID-19 diagnosis on or after February 4th, 2020. Um, to me, that language is broad enough to include um, people who are here temporarily uh, from a different country. Um, again, they don't specify uh, when they say uninsured individuals and we'll have to see if further details come out. But right now, my assumption is that that would cover any sort of uninsured farm workers. The services that are covered are specimen collection, diagnostic and antibody testing, testing related to office visits, urgent care or emergency rooms, and also uh, testing related visits that are completed via telehealth, um, which also tells me that uh, perhaps you do not need uh, a, a confirmed test as long as you have the diagnosis of COVID. Um, again, not sure about the details on that as well. 
um, treatment, including office visits. So that would include our folks who are community providers and not hospitals, emergency room, inpatient, outpatient observation, uh, skilled nursing facilities, long-term acute care facilities, acute inpatient rehab, home health, um, durable medical equipment, such as oxygen and ventilators, uh, ambulance transportation, uh, and even non-emergent patient transfers, FDA approved drugs, um, as they are administered as part of an inpatient stay. So I will say that outpatient drugs are not covered under this, outpatient prescription drugs to treat COVID are not covered under this. Um, also not covered under this are hospice services um, and anything where the treatment is where COVID-19 is not the primary diagnosis um, with the exception for pregnancy um, when the COVID-19 code may be listed as secondary. So pretty comprehensive program. Again, we're still trying to figure out the details, um, but what hospitals will be doing and um, which other providers should be doing, and again, this is only for COVID-19 treatment. This is not funding for uninsured folks for every other treatment, but they'll be going through a portal and then they'll be receiving a Medicare uh, reimbursement uh, for that treatment. So Devin, uh, as we were looking at that um, the other day that, uh, and, and maybe Jen Carby can comment a little bit on this as well, um, but then that would include all clinics outside of the hospital. If there's a if there's a, tr a, a testing, a diagnosis, a treatment um, that we're, we're looking at our free clinics who uh, treat a number of uninsured. So from your knowledge that would include those clinics, can they make an application uh, to the federal government through that portal as well? Do you know? That, that is my very limited understanding <laughs> again. <laughs> Um, uh, but yes, I, it, the, everything that I've read has said providers, it hasn't limited it to hospitals. So that would be my understanding. Jen, you want to, did you want to add anything there? Sure. Jennifer Carby, legislative council. Um, so it, it is, uh, my general understanding is the same as Devon's. I think the only issue that may come up with some of the free clinics is that some of them don't have claims um, systems because they don't bill. Um, so when they provide all of their services for free, um, and some of this is, is coming from Steve Meyer, who had answered a question on this the other day, um, to get reimbursed, you have to file, the providers have to file claims through a claims portal. If they don't have a claims filing system because they don't charge fees, they may not have a claims filing system. So it may be difficult for them to recoup through um, this particular program, but I think the free clinics have identified potential other um, grant funding sources and and uh, other options that they may be using. So I did I did send a, a note off to Steve Meyer about that and asked him for he said that there was a possibility that they could uh, apply. So we'll have to follow up with him um, and see what he what his reply is. He was going to check further. So, Devin, uh, thank you. Uh, keep going. So then the wait, next wait, wait. Uh, uh, representative oh. Lippard has his hand up, but he's not, he's still muted. Well, my question, my question is, is there any information about um, how one documents that they're uninsured does one have to apply for medicaid and be denied uh are there no. are there other criteria that uh establish you as quote uninsured that one has to go through before uh, becoming uh, eligible for this funding that's a great question i don't believe that they have to go through and be denied, but I can check on that. Um, it is certainly a good opportunity and I've been reading up on how uh, our providers could take advantage of getting folks into Medicaid and other coverage um, right now, but um, I haven't seen anything that says rule out 
uh, other coverage for them or have them apply to Medicaid and get denied. But I will check and get back to you. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and another question. So as you're talking about um, Medicare reimbursement, and this is all post-treatment, it, let's suppose it's everything. It's uh, post-treatment, post-outpatient. What is, is it? Does it go along as a code fee for service, or does it, is it more encompassing for the whole patient? Is it a prospective type payment and you know reconciliation? We don't know, or we do. Know. I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> um, like I said, the our uh, our financial folks are going through the web portal trainings um, and I can get some feedback from them after they've gone through those trainings, but I do not know that yet. Yeah, I mean, it got, kind of seems like it would be um, a lot of administrative work uh, to go through step by step. Uh, we'll see. It sounds yeah. like Jen might know. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Thanks. Well, it does see, so I'm looking at some of the materials that are available and I looked at some of it the other day, but I think some of it, as Devin said, is literally just coming out. Um, but that the re the reimbursement is at Medicare rates. Um, right. So I think it is they they provide the uh, there's a whole attestation and an 11 page um, certification and attestation form um, that the that the recipient of the funds, the provider is the recipient of the funds. So um, they file the claim and they get reimbursed at Medicare rates. If there are Medicare, hundred percent of Medicare rates. Um, if there is no Medicare standard rate, a calculated average rate will be used. Okay. Um, there are, I have two folks with questions, uh, representative Christensen and then uh, Representative Cordes. I may have misunderstood you, but did you say that hospice was not covered or if COVID is not the primary cause? That seems to encompass a lot of people during this time. Mm -hmm. Am I incorrect in that? So you're correct. I said that right now they are saying hospice services are not covered. Hmm. Um, or if COVID, because there's a lot of false negatives. We heard from a farm worker the other day that he thought he was having a heart attack. He wasn't sure. He went in and all the symptoms, the doctor said, you have COVID, but his, he had two negative tests. So would that not be covered, it seems? So I was wondering about that as well. And I... I am not sure yet. From what I can tell, what it says is if your listed diagnosis is COVID, um, which I think the doctor may be able to do without a test, but I'd want to double check that and see if there are any federal strings attached. Thank you. Yeah, we did hear, we did hear that um, the other day that depending on what codes were put down, regardless of the testing, because it is so uh, problematic that right yeah uh, representative Cordes has a question thank you I have um, and, and you can fill us in later uh, Devin um, but my questions are around um, both eligibility requirements um, again what what would um, for example an undocumented Vermonter need to do um, to be sure that their care was covered. Um, and secondly, could uh, hospitals, do they have the option to refuse to, re uh, to provide care to an undocumented Vermonter or someone um, from outside um, the country no, hospitals do not have the right to refuse care to anyone um, when, particularly when they're going through the emergency department. But no, we would not be able to refuse care. Okay, so um, if you could get back to us on what specific requirements hospitals might um, 
demand if someone presented at the the ER, for example, um, social security, proof of re residency, that, that sort of thing. That would be helpful. Yeah, I can get, I can get back to you on that. Um, again, I'm not sure what this program requires. Um, and yeah, I can get back to you with that information. Thank you. Uh, Representative Houghton has a question. I know this is all very new, Devin, but I'm curious if there's a process in place to ensure that uninsured people know this is available to them, because even though it's out there, we need to make sure they know so they seek treatment. Yeah, I think we'll be um, posting it on our website. We have uh, information available to the public. Um, we would hope that all of you would share this with your constituents. Um, and I um, would have, I mean, we have done a variety of PSAs. We've done six PSAs by now. Um, I have to see what our, our budget is, but um, there are, um, my boss is gonna kill me. <laughs> but we can certainly talk about, <laughs> we can what? certainly talk about, um, uh, ways to get the word out to the to the rest of the public because we do want them to not forgo care, uh, especially if they have COVID nineteen symptoms. So two questions or two comments, I guess, come up as a result of what you've just said, and that is, um, is there any money within any of the CARES acts that we've seen uh, that allows for education? I know I've seen education somewhere, somewhere along the line. But would that include a payment for PSAs from uh, healthcare organizations or, you know, Department of Health, perhaps? So that's one comment. The the other one is, um, given that the migrant justice program is so connected with so many different uh, undocumented workers, that that's probably the direct link to the folks that people are concerned about um, right now. So uh, that would that would help. And then again, the whole program that's been instituted for homeless populations uh, and housing, there's another link that can be made there. So I'm thinking that some of the organizations that are working so hard to keep people safe might be the very organizations that can communicate with their providers and with the people directly about what might be available to them. So we'll have to figure out a good way to put that listserv together. Yeah, given Vermont's low uninsured rate, it, yes. I think a sort of a targeted approach would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions at this point? Representative China. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, you, you were talking about um, that people to, in order to access the funding providers would use some kind of portal or some there'd be some way that they they're entering data into some system to get reimbursed and i'm just i don't i don't i'm curious if you know um how that process mirrors other claims processes right now and what kind of data will be collected and shared with the federal government about people as part of this accessing this funding um i don't know if you know yeah it's a great question the um I can, like I said, our uh, financial folks are getting trained on this this week, so I can ask them what they're seeing in terms of information that's required. Um, but when I see the word claims portal, I run away screaming, so I haven't, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't um, deeply explored it, but I will certainly ask them and see what kind of information is required. Thank you. Um, Representative Page. Yes, ma'am. I have a, a comment regarding um, individuals without insurance. Um, what has changed prior to this crisis? I always thought that hospitals always have been open to individuals that had no, had no insurance. So I don't see that this is anything really new uh, unless the reimbursement process for hospitals has changed. Um, can you address that, Devin? Yes, so I think what's new about this is 
One, it, um, there, and again, this is all new to me, but this, there does not appear to be any sort of financial limits or anything else um, around this. Uh, so it just applies to anyone who's uninsured. Again, I want to check the details on that, but also um, hospitals are actually getting reimbursed for the treatment, whereas normally they would use their dish funding to cover the treatment and absorb the costs and um, shift funding around to, to so, cover that treatment. So there really hasn't been a change in, in the funding. The hospitals have always been reimbursed one way or the other before or after. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> they do not get reimbursed. That is what our disproportionate share funding is for. It doesn't, as far as we can tell, cover um, all of those costs, but okay. uh, that's part of what we use it for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, we're in we're in extreme times right now. The pandemic is extremely costly. When you what did you say the cost would be? Fourteen billion to forty two billion. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, and and so, we are worried about that because it's coming out of the provider fund, and you know that is funding that will go to states that have not done the Obamacare expansion and. Um, and that will deplete the fund, which is, you know, divided up between all the providers in the country. So Vermont may see less of that funding, just because we have a high uninsured or high insured rate. Can, can I just say that? I have, it, oh, it, oh, oh, is it on this topic? Because I've got two others yeah. in the queue ahead of you. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I just, I mean, my understanding from reading media accounts broadly that. Uh, the administration could have opened the uh, enrollment period, uh, but chose not to do that with the federal uh, exchanges. And this is their way of uh, trying to do that without having to acknowledge uh, the role of uh, care that was established under the Affordable Care Act. And that in fact, for many of the states that did not expand Medicaid, uh, this is a way to provide them with funds. Uh, Vermont is not going to be a major beneficiary. Uh, and so I think this is, we need to understand the larger context in which this was created. That's right. Uh, yeah, I, I have a subsequent question, but I'll, I'll get back in line. <laughs> okay, uh, Representative Houghton and then Representative Donahue, and then back to Representative Lippert. So Devin, this might not be something you're able to answer right away, but you know, based on, on everything we've discussed and everything that's come out from the feds, as well as what we've done as a state, is there a population now or a um, type of treatment that we are missing that as a state, you feel we should step up and do something? You know, I think, um... I reserve the right to get back to you on that. That's fine. That's fine. You don't have to answer right now. <laughs> um, but I think the state has really stepped up to take care of its populations. I know the commercial insurers are covering all the inpatient costs for uh, for folks uh, 100% so that they don't have the out-of-pocket for that, which I think is great, which helps with the high-deductible health plans. Um, if I'm remembering that right, but um, I really think the state has had a great and helpful response when it's come to thinking about different populations and trying to get coverage for them. Um, but I will think about that further and get back to you if anything Thanks. jumps out at me. Representative Donahue. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, direct follow up to that first. Um, from what we heard last week, I think the um, people who have insurance through their employment where they're self-insured might not be uh, covered in terms of copay and deductible. And so that's a, I think that's a gap in terms of, um, but the question I had was in terms of this new funding, if you know yet, how does that intersect with the hospital's process for people 
um, applying for um, charity care, however it's labeled, will they just bypass that process if they're uninsured or will they still go that route as well? So I, um, I think our financial folks are figuring out that process right now, but my assumption would be that this process would be elevated um, as a priority just because we, um, it is full coverage and we will get reimbursed for it. So mm -hmm. I imagine this would be the sort of first priority with um, follow up for anything that's not covered through the financial assistance policies. That, I, yeah, that's what I would hope. Um, you could imagine a scenario where it's somebody who, um, one of that category of folks who choose not to be insured, choose not to get insurance, although they uh, financially could, could be um, paying for it. Um, and this would give access to them and there wouldn't be any review of, the, of whether in fact they, you know, they made that choice and should be paying themselves. Right. Uh, Representative Lippert, you're up. My, my question uh, goes, moves away from this new federal program. And so perhaps uh, if there are any other questions regarding this, um, uh, but let me say what, what, I, my, my, what my question well, is. Let me, let's do it this way, Bill. Um, yeah. well, Cause I, I don't know that Devin has completed everything cool. on her okay, fine. testimony. Let's but hear from why don't you yeah. ask I'll hold the, my question. Well, well question. ask it and let's put it out there on the table so we know what's coming and then, okay. um, well, well, we'll, try to, we'll try to avoid diversion at all costs until we get to the end. Okay. Well, my question is a follow-up to our previous testimony uh, from, I think it was last week, I lose track of time, but uh, where it has to do with not just COVID-19 and hospital, but general access to hospital services through uh, charity care or um, okay. however that's termed, and having to do particularly with, uh, as you indicated, I, with the possibility that uh, if you're in this country, if you're in the state from another country and your dependents are elsewhere, that the hospital uh, process of eligibility for financial assistance doesn't recognize that. Okay, hold that question. That's a good question. And I think we all wanna hear the answer to it. So don't forget it. It's great. Um, Devin, uh, before you, Go ahead. I do have a question. Can I answer? Can I ask you that question now? Or were you going to say something? I didn't want to interrupt. Okay. Um, so I notice in the in your testimony it talks about uh, something that we mentioned last time, which is medically necessary care. All right. So care that's medically necessary, and I and you did say uh, outpatient care. I'm. Um, Wondering the, and I don't know that you or Jen can answer this question at this point, but the extent of that outpatient care, does it extend to the immediate family uh, or folks for uh, mental health um, counseling or other similar counseling needs that might be a result of uh, quarantine, isolation, uh, or simply under the stress of the disease for folks who are diagnosed with COVID-19. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that is a great question. I do not know, and I don't think they get specific enough when I look at this, uh, if it would encompass, uh, I imagine, when they say that their primary diagnosis is COVID-19, I would think it's for services directly involved with COVID-19. Um, but that is certainly some, a question that I can put out to listservs and try to ask other folks at the national level to see if mental health is included in there. Okay, that I, would be helpful. Yeah. I worry that our federal government is not so expansive, especially 
around mental health. So I'm not sure we're going to get the answer that we want, but um, it's definitely a question worth asking. Okay, thank you. And as part of that, the other the other piece of that is when we look at medically necessary, what we heard from folks last week is that um, some of the um, farm workers are living in very close conditions and don't have a place to go accessible. So uh, I've been talking with people about how can they be provided a, a, a trailer or some place to live during isolation. And if it's not available to them, to them uh, when they go back to the farm, does would the hundred billion dollars cover a portion of a living quarters that would be temporary? Uh, because it seems to me that part of the problem that we're seeing with uh, people who are uninsured is either they're homeless or they're stuck in an unforgiving situation where they can't remove themselves from others and be safe. So. That's a question that probably you can't answer, but it, it would be really helpful to know. I So I can answer that question. And due oh, to the uh, fact that this is, know. <laughs> this is through, this is healthcare services and it's through a claims portal. I do not think that funding would apply for those services. Uh, so, okay. And because our ACO and our all payer waiver is uh, separate from the national standards, then it wouldn't, I mean, because we do have some uh, support services available for people through hospitals. Yeah, this is not going through our ACO though. This is a separate federal portal that people have to go through. And, and um, it, it is not on the list of covered services. And again, with that claims, I think it really is more specific to medical services being offered. I appreciate your creativity though. <laughs> no, but the, I mean, for me, quarantine and isolation is clearly a medical need and a medical cert. Uh, okay. All right, Jen, did you want to add anything to that one? <laughs> I, I think I agree with Devin. It, it, it appears to be a claims-based reimbursement system. So while quarantine may be a public health solution, it's not a billable um, medical service that is provided. Uh, and just okay. looking at the list of the types of things that they're talking about um, for which reimbursement would be made, it's really testing and treatment services. It's um, it's not, you know, ancillary supports that may be appropriate from a public health standpoint. Not, no public health services. Oh dear. Uh, okay. Well, just to let the committee know that um, I am working on that issue around uh, how to get adequate facilities for some of these folks. So I will keep you informed um, as we go forward with that. Uh, Devin, I know you have other things on your uh, testimony. Do you want to keep going? Sure. So that is the federal uninsured um, program. If folks don't have any other questions on that, I'll move to the just the general information about hospital financial assistance policies, which it sounded like you wanted to hear about also. Okay. Um, so under IRS law uh, for hospitals to, as you all know, all of our hospitals are nonprofit. In order for them to remain nonprofit, they must have a financial assistance policy. Um, and there are a lot of federal regulations that guide this policy, but um, I think the overall framework is there are federal regulations on what uh, the process the policy should have and um, what elements it should include and, uh, you know, how it should be adopted and how it should be communicated to the community. Um, but it doesn't specify what the levels of um, income should be or um, the eligibility criteria. It leaves that to hospitals to do at the local level. 
um, because that way hospitals can take into account various factors that may impact their community. So if you are in a community with a very high cost of living, you may want to have a more generous financial assistance policy, knowing that your um, a person's, a lot of a person's income may be going towards other things like food and housing, and they may not have a lot left over for um, for healthcare, even though their um, income is fairly high. So there's a lot of local variation when it comes to financial assistance policies and eligibility criteria for financial assistance policies. Uh, the federal requirements for the financial assistance policies are that it applies to all emergency and medically necessary care. Um, so no going in to get a totally elective plastic surgery or anything like that. It doesn't cover those things. Um, uh, the hospital must list all levels of financial assistance the hospital offers and the eligibility criteria for each level. So the feds require that the hospitals have that information available, um, but the IRS does not determine what those eligib eligibility levels will be. Um, the hospitals must state how the patients can apply for the assistance, uh, describe how the hospital calculates charges to patients eligible for financial assistance, clarify that patients who are eligible for financial help may not be charged more than the amounts generally billed to an insured patient. So um, have on there that you don't necessarily get that um, terrible bill, but you're more in line with the billing of someone who is um, uh, an insured person uh, with that negotiated rate. Uh, describe any potential collection steps the hospital will take. Uh, list third-party sources the hospital used to determine whether a patient is presumptively eligible for financial aid. Um, so if you're looking at a database to, or checking somewhere to see if someone can be eligible instead of having to fill out paperwork, um, you have to let the person know that you're doing that. Uh, include, include or link to a list of providers it covers and does not cover, give contact, and, and I'll say that that's virtually everyone for our hospitals. When I've gone and looked at that, uh, it tends to be just about all the physicians in our hospitals. Um, give contact information for patients who need more assistance um, and provide a complete list of information and documentation patients need to provide throughout the application process. So those are the sorts of um, things that are specific for the financial assistance policy. To implement the financial assistance policy, it goes through a governance process where it's adopted by hospital leadership. So again, that sort of local approach where you work with the board. Um, and I think a lot of hospitals take into account their community health needs assessment and other information to figure out what the right balance is for their community, and then it's adopted by the hospital leadership. Um, uh, all of the information, including the policy, the actual form that you fill out, and a plain language summary must be available online. We've been working really hard, um, although that has been put on hold with COVID-19, but we have been working with the healthcare advocate um, because I think the healthcare advocates uh, definition of plain language and every other person's definition of plain language can uh, vary from a uh, attorney's definition of plain language who's trying to meet all of the IRS criteria. So um, we have continued to work with them to make our policies a little more clear. We've made a lot of headway with uh, the University of Vermont Health Network on that issue, and we're hoping to, um, and Rutland Regional Medical Center, we're hoping to spread it out to our other hospitals as well. Um, there have to be hard copies available for those who uh, don't have access, well, for everyone, um, but in order to get those who don't have access to the internet and those must be available upon request and available in the emergency departments and the admission areas. 
uh, you have to notify and inform the community about the financial assistance policy. And then um, you have to notify individuals who receive care about the policy. So have a paper copy at intake or discharge, have written notice on billing statements, and have public displays in emergency departments and admission areas. And then also translate the pro uh, policy into other language in accordance with the language population. So make sure that it's accessible to those who speak other languages as well. And there's the threshold for that. So those are the IRS uh, requirements for the policies. And again, there is wide variation on the policies throughout the state uh, as hospitals take into account the various needs of their communities. Thank you. Uh, uh, how frequently uh, do those policies change? Are they dependent on sort of the uh, health needs assessment process? To, are they in, in place in perpetuity? Are they reviewed regularly by the governance body or, uh, and the medical staff or financial staff? Yeah, that's a good question. I can tell you that um, the latest IRS requirements came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. So oh. they have at least been updated as of 2015 um, in terms of uh, when they're reviewed. I do know, uh, like I said, the, H the healthcare advocate has been working with us on it. They have visited a bunch of our hospitals, I believe five hospitals uh, to sit down with them and talk about their policies. Um, and there was, there were changes made and updates made as a result of that, or those changes are in process. Um, but I, I'm not sure if there's anything, uh, any, uh, one way that the hospitals do it. I imagine they, uh, revisit it periodically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some. Some governance bodies have rules about going through their um, bylaws and their policies on a regular basis. I would, uh, 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 probably uh, hospitals are not um, immune from wanting to do that. But, um, questions from folks before we jump ship and go to Representative Lippert. Okay, thank you for that update. Um, uh, I'm sure that right now is, uh, hospitals are not even considering doing that, given the other stresses and strains on the financial offices. Um, it is important work, and we want to yes, continue to improve those. But yes, I would say that this is on pause a little bit. Yeah. I see that Bill, Representative Durfee Bill, has a question. Who does? Representative, oh, Durfee. Representative Durfee. I, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, I, I just put it up. Go Thank ahead. you. Uh, Devin, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, going forward in, in practice, the hospitals won't be, if, if someone shows up without insurance, the hospitals and, and presents with COVID, the hospitals won't be billing the individual, but were there, excuse me, the phone is ringing in the background here, so I'll try to make this quick before my You're okay, don't up. worry. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but were there, were there people who were build previously who um, before this policy was put into place uh, who now would not have to be you know facing that those concerns those payment concerns with the COVID-19 program right yeah yeah I I um I think that people have been holding their billing for now I can't guarantee that but I I think for the most part our hospitals have not um, built for this yet and so now that we have this program into place we will go forward with that program um, but again I think it is um, you know hospitals will be motivated to reach out to folks and let them know about this program because they will actually get reimbursed as opposed to uh the natural state of things where they would not 
be getting directly reimbursed for the services. So they have a lot of motivation there. One other thing that while we're on the COVID-19 program, I did want to point out, um, as Representative Lippert said, you know, looking at the broader context, from what I have read, um, the so there's uh, it's still a little bit unclear about how the funding will work for all of this. And there has been a sort of, um, you know, the, the funding will go until it runs out. So I will not say that it's a guarantee that all uninsured will get their coverage. I would hope so. Um, but, but that's where the program is right now. So that was actually a question I was going to ask you. Um, so it is sort of first come, first serve almost. Yeah. But yeah. And, then the, and then the other question is it's retroactive to February for folks who were diagnosed. Um, and there's no cutoff to the accessibility of this funding if and when the emergency declaration ends at the federal level. This just goes on. True or false? Okay. I think it goes on, um, okay. uh, but I would want to check on that. I do think it goes on just because claims can take a couple of months to go through. So mm -hmm. um, I imagine it will go on, but I don't have the answer for that in front of me. Well, the last couple of things that you said, A, that if it runs out, then we can't guarantee our uninsured are covered. And that right. puts huge pressures right. on the hospitals for your um, uh, charity care. And then the other piece is how long this goes on. That's a concern that we have, especially given, I don't know, what other states are doing and the potential for the next surge. So there are a lot of transitional questions that need, probably should be considered at some point. Yeah, and I will say it's part of the CARES Act funding, which is not, I don't believe it's tied to the national state of the emergency. So it goes as long as the funding runs out. And I don't believe that funding is tied to the national state of emergency. So I don't think it, okay. it has a tie there. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Jen can correct me on that, though. <laughs> All right. So uh, any other questions regarding the uh, federal dollars and program? Sounds like it's emerging, and we'll keep learning more about it. Any other questions? I think Representative Smith yes, sir. Rep Representative Smith. Go ahead. Thanks, Bill. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Devin, you're talking about when you're talking about migrant workers. Are you referring to illegal migrant farm workers as well? I'm referring to all farm workers. Oh, you are then? Yes. So when an un uninsured Vermonter goes into a hospital, they're given the option, if they don't have any insurance, they're given the option of, you know, can you pay this much a month to the hospital? And most people will do that. Are these offers being asked to these uh, the migrant farm workers as well, if they're able to pay? So if they're going in there for COVID-19 treatment, and I, so I guess my first question is, are you asking about the COVID-19 treatment piece? Is, is everything waived for Vermonters that have, have been working and have COVID that don't have insurance? Can they go in and not have to worry about paying as well as uh, the migrant workers? That is my understanding. Um, it is for all uninsured people. Again, I want to say that with the caveat of this came out as a federal program recently. It's not tied to any legislative language, which I'd always like to see first, but it's sure. it's sort of coming up as we go along. So, but what I've read so far is that any insured individual um, who has the COVID-19 diagnosis. All right. Thank you. Okay. Or any uninsured. Sorry about that. Right. You got it. We got it. Um, okay, any other questions regarding the CARES Act? Okay, so we have a lineup of three people who uh, have questions um, 
about another topic or a more general question for Devin. And so that would be uh, Representative Lippert, then Representative Rogers, and then Rep uh, Senator Lyons. So let's start with Representative Lippert. Okay, I was gonna say, we didn't quite get to the questions which I had posed earlier. Um, so uh, based on what you've said, Devin, I'm, I'm guessing the answer is going to be, it will vary by hospital as they respond to their local area. That doesn't seem completely satisfactory to me, to be quite honest. And um, I, I would like to actually have information and ask you to uh, see if you can get information about the specific suggestion that uh, a migrant or immigrant farm worker uh, who seeking hospital care and is in fact supporting family outside the country uh, does or does not uh, get to take that into account in terms of financial assistance eligibility. Mm -hmm. So we okay, also- well. Because that, I mean, that's, it's been specifically suggested and I would like to just have a really clear understanding uh, particularly for hospitals in the areas where, you know, we have, we have areas of the state where uh, we have more farm workers, uh, you know, than others. And uh, those are the hospitals that I would particularly be interested in. And to be quite honest, I, you know, if I were the CEO of uh, one of those hospitals, it's entirely conceivable that I would have no idea that buried in a policy somewhere was something like this. Uh, and that if I was aware of it, I might say, please change that now. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I really would like to try to shine a light on the question that was raised as we took testimony from the farm worker community and, and see if we can't uh, uh, move the dial on that if, if this is an issue. Yeah, I think what I would ask is um, in the light of the coverage for the uninsured right now and how this individual would be covered for their COVID-19 um, that I can work on that issue. Um, it seems like it should be a non-issue. Maybe not immediately. COVID. It seems like it should be a non-issue for COVID-19. But the problem right. also is that we're also encouraging people to seek care even in the COVID-19 period uh, for, for care they really need. And so I do think it's, I, I think particularly for our farm worker community, I think it's an issue uh, that's relevant at this time as well. Yeah, I can understand that. I think it, it's a, um, it can be a tough balance when you're writing a policy between um, basing it on household because you don't want to tie it to the legal status of marriage um, versus basing it. So basing it on that physical household versus basing it on other things. And so I think that's something that gets weighed when these policies are made. And I can try to check in our, with our hospitals that if it's okay with you, I'm gonna limit it to the hospitals that are in the areas where there's uh, high populations yeah, of migrant workers. Of workers. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. It's a great place, a great um, way to start. And check into it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. We'll also be hearing from Addie Stromolo, uh, who may have some additional information right. on that. I, I, have a, I have a request later, uh, Senator Lyons, right. after others have asked questions. Okay. Um, Representative Rogers. Thanks, Devin. I just wanted to actually follow up on something from, I believe it was the last time you testified with us about the HHS money that the hospitals had received. And at the time you guys had received, or you, you testified that there had been no guidance that was given that had gone along with it. So I was wondering if guidance has since been issued or if the hospitals are feeling relatively safe in proceeding to use the money as they most need to, to, to make themselves financially whole and if there's concern about clawback. Yeah, so the... Um, the money that we received a couple of weeks, so there's been a couple of different tranches. Um, and this is just to be clear, this is the hundred billion dollar fund, which has now been increased to 175 billion fund for all providers. 
um, all healthcare providers, uh, including hospitals. Um, the first amount we received was based on our Medicare fee-for-service claims from 2018. The second tranche, as they're calling it, came out last Friday, and that was uh, basically taking your um, Medicare, taking your net patient services revenue, uh, multiplying it, or basically taking whatever you had for net patient services revenue and dividing that by the 50 billion, using that as a multiplier um, and providing you with whatever you should, whatever would make you whole that you subtracting out what you received the week before. So they said, we're looking at your 2018 Medicare stuff. I'm gonna put this really general. We're looking at your 2018 Medicare stuff. Um, and for those hospitals or your 2018 net patient revenue, for those hospitals that were high Medicaid or children's hospitals, um, you didn't get the lot, a lot the week before. So based on that, you will be getting more. Um, and then anyone else will um, receive a little bit more. Um, our hospitals receive just a little bit more. We're talking to Maryland because they also have many hospitals that got no additional funding and they too have a similar sort of Medicare situation with their all pair model. So we're trying to learn more from that. But um, I think the big story is that that funding that we've received comprises only 16% of the federal funding that hospitals have received. The rest of that is all loans. So the bulk of what we're receiving is the advanced Medicare payments. And that is a loan that will have to be paid back at a 10.2% rate. Um, so I would say that hospitals are not feeling uh, confident <laughs> um, considering that this is a long-term thing that's happening and most of the funding they're receiving is a loan um, that they will have to pay back at a high interest rate and it seems like this will be playing out in the long term. And so the short term, I think a lot of our hospitals are very uh, very concerned. Um, and I think Brian Nall put it well when he said, you know, he had about a million something as a grant, eight million as this loan, and that would last him until about June. Um, so we are going to have a, a rural tranche coming out most likely next week. Um, and again, we don't know what is considered rural. Um, and we're not sure how that's going to be divvied up, but um, we're hopeful to receive some funding from that. Thanks. My, yeah, my question about guide, guidance was more about, so for the grant money that the hospitals did receive, have they received guidance about how they can spend it or are they operating under the assumption that it can be spent as the hospital needs most? And if so, is there concern that there would be clawback or or are hospitals feeling pretty confident that they can use the money as they see fit? Does that make I think sense? hospitals are feeling confident that they can use that grant money as they see fit. Um, yeah. And for, we just wish that we had um, some more in the form of grants instead of loans. Understood. Thank you. Okay. All right, I, I have a quick question and it is not a quick answer, but um, you can make it a short answer <clears throat> um, because it, it is different from the issues we've been discussing. Uh, but one of the things that we understand is how important the prospective payment program has been to all providers, but um, I would think in particular to hospitals and thinking uh, f going forward and thinking, it, it, are the, is the hospital association uh, supportive of and thinking about having some kind of a global budgeting system that uh, 
would in many ways insulate hospitals from the kind of uh, pr the, the financial difficulties that are popping up with the pandemic. So it's really a question about the what the thoughts are around global budgeting. It is something that I'm particularly interested in and I think others are as well. So I think the hospitals are not there yet because we're still um, sort of in the immediate situation and again, trying to see what our financial situation will be beyond the next couple of months and stabilize a bit. Um, I will say that there's a lot of frustration with, um, I know that the concept of uh, having regular payments is a good one, but there is a lot of frustration amongst our hospitals with Medicare. Um, so Medicare has been a sticking point with one care, especially with critical access hospitals. Um, and the way that they have not, Medicare has not really taken into account the unique position of critical access hospitals. And um, again, with this, um, with this latest snafu with the federal funding. So um, I think before we had any discussion, we would need a much uh, greater uh, commitment from Medicare, or at least um, an ability to respond to our needs from Medicare. And I think that will be difficult. All right, thank you. Uh, we don't need to get into the details now, but at some point it might be helpful just to have a conversation. Maybe it's outside of committee. All right, um, other questions for Devin? Okay. Thank you very much, Devin. We, we greatly appreciate the time that you've taken. And as you sort out all the tranches that are coming <laughs> to us and the, the, the portal and what it means for people who are uninsured would be really helpful to keep us posted as much as you can. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Devin. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're on more or less on time. And um, our next topic is really about uh, looking at standards of care. And uh, Cindy Brzezzi is with us. Um, and Hannah, wait, is Kelly, are you here? Kelly Dougherty? I, I am. I am there you having are. difficult Zoom link, so I'm only on by phone. I apologize, I can't see you all. Oh, um, maybe um, who had that other Zoom link? I've, no. been, I've gotten them all from Nellie, but for some okay. reason they're just being stuck in launch mode and don't oh. go anywhere. Well, uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. But we, um, we have you, we can hear you very well. So um, I don't know if you and Cindy have had a conversation about um, how you would like to proceed, but you are first up on the agenda. So we'll let you go ahead unless you have had a conversation with Cindy and, and have decided differently. I also see that David Englander is with us. You have a backup team. So, um, Hi, both. Hi. okay. Do you have us an order that you'd like to go in? Um, I think it depends on the pleasure of the committee. Um, if you, Cindy and I both know what each of us are going to cover. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I think that we could start um, either way. I'm happy to go first and um, entertain questions. Or if you'd like to have Cindy go first, I'll leave it to the committees to decide. Okay, well, why don't you start out and then um, we'll try to be... Um, We'll, we'll try to be careful about asking too many question, questions until we've also heard from Cindy. So, but we will, okay. uh, we will do that. So go, go right ahead, Kelly. And thanks for being here. Sure. Sure. So um, I was just going to kind of give an overview of uh, the process of putting together the plan, sort of where we are now. And then I understand that the committees have a particular interest uh, understandably so, in the ventilator allocation plan. 
So um, I'll just sort of give a little introduction and then we can uh, go from there. So as I'm sure that you all are aware, the uh, crisis standards of care sort of go into effect whenever there's a declaration of an emergency. Um, and there are different levels um, of the plan and it covers a lot of different um, areas of need in terms of medical services. And really what it's designed to do is to basically provide some guidelines or guardrails um, for allocation of resources in times of scarcity uh, to ensure that decisions are made. Um, there's sort of this fine balance between um, subjective decision making um, where you're like where there could be bias at play and providing some guidelines so that there's consistency across providers in terms of the things that they're considering um, at different levels of I guess you would say crisis um, when delivering medical care. So you know it's really um, designed to uh, uh, make decisions with some uh, consistency and guidelines in place, like I said. So the, the crisis standards of care plan is really a living document and it's um, subject to change, you know, as, as we learn and grow with it. Um, the plan itself is a requirement of the uh, hospital preparedness grant, grant that the health department gets from CDC. And the current plan um, was put together, uh, was published last summer, 2019, but it was um, the product of a, about a two year process that involved um, lots of different stakeholders and they're listed in the plan. Uh, but, you know, folks from Boz, I know you just heard from Devin Green, uh, statewide organizations, you know, legal aid, disability rights, Vermont, various um, different stakeholders. So um, the ventilator allocation plan uh, that is in the current crisis standards of care, I should say, is actually in the process of being revised. Um, the one that is that is actually published in the plan on our website was based on one that uh, we used that was published in Minnesota. And um, one thing I would like to stress, like I said before, is that um, the plan itself is, is not designed to be prescriptive per se, but to provide guidelines. So really when it comes to looking at, in this example, the ventilator allocation, um, it would really be based on clinical presentation uh, in a, you know, and looking at those guidelines, not the presence or absence of a particular factor such as age or underlying conditions. And I, I would like to stress that the underlying conditions that are listed in our plan um, are really just cited as examples. They're not designed to say that uh, across the board that people of a certain age or people with certain conditions um, would be uh, denied uh, a ventilator. So clinical judgment is always of the utmost importance and, and it's definitely not a black and white um, situation. The, the, draft that is, the draft revision that is currently underway um, was was started being drafted after this incident started because we, you know, wanted to anticipate that this could be an issue. And luckily, um, it looks like we will not need to be, uh, we will not have scarcity in ventilators, at least at this point. As of right now, we have one person in the state of Vermont who is on a ventilator. Um, and we're really hoping with this next draft plan that we move more from the, what appears to be more quantitative scoring um, in the current plan and have that move a little bit further along the spectrum to make it more, um, to emphasize that there is a subjective 
clinical judgment component to it. So um, in the new draft plan, like factors that may be considered in terms of uh, making those decisions about uh, ventilator allocation would be um, validated metrics. For example, the modified sequential organ failure assessment score, um, prognosis and likelihood of treatment response based on risk factors relating to the existing event, coexistent and stage failure of a major organ or other accepted medical factors, and availability of institutional resources to address the clinical needs of every patient. The things that would not be considered um, would be sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, all of those um, special categories. And we would not, factors that also would not be considered would be disability or degree of disability, um, functional status, mental health diagnosis, chronic disease diagnosis, or positive status for infectious diseases. So those things in and of themselves would not be a, um, a limiting factor in terms of the allocation of that resource. So I'm going to pause there to see if there are any questions um, or anything that I could um, elaborate on. So we have two questions uh, so far. And well, why don't we have the questions asked? And then um, if you think that um, we have three questions, if you think that Cindy Brzezzi's testimony will help clarify the answers, then just let us know so um, we can we can capture that thought as well. Okay. So we have Representative Cordes, Representative Rogers, and Representative Donahue. Thank you. Um, I, it, I'm glad to hear uh, the last few things you said um, that um, excludes um, that everyone would be included in the crisis standards of care. Um, and I'm wondering what proactive um, systemic measures the committee um, has applied to ensure that um, everyone involved in, in um, decision-making using crisis standards of care um, has been addressing implicit bias for all of those um, groups of folks, including people with disabilities. So it's, it's one thing to say, uh, we're not gonna do that, um, but it's an entirely another thing to have um, a proactive system in place um, that you can evaluate on a regular basis to make sure um, and that you can gather data from um, so that you can be sure that um, you limit the amount of implicit bias in these decisions. Yeah, so um, in the new draft plan that um, hopefully will be released soon, um, there is a very uh, prescriptive process for how um, the request for ventilators would be um, adjudicated. And there is a, a concrete plan for um, an appeals process. So should um, a healthcare provider need a ventilator for a patient and they were, um, uh, and we were in a scarcity situation, um, there would be multiple um, entities that would be involved in reviewing that request. So it would really be um, not a single person making that decision. And then should there be a questionable decision, there would be um, a fair resource allocation appeals team. And so um, that team would review um, the decision to be sure that um, it was made, you know, based on um, the guidelines that are outlined in the plan. So just to Does that answer your question? It, it, um, that sounds like a, a sort of a, 
reactive or retrospective um, approach, um, what if everyone in the group um, was not aware of the impact of implicit bias and that um, current data around COVID, access to COVID testing and treatment is showing that marginalized communities are being <clears throat> um, uh, inequitably um, treated. And it's really important to be proactive um, and it, so that everyone in the committee um, has understanding training around implicit bias before it gets to a point where you would need an appeals process. Right, right. And, and the appeals process is in, in addition to um, efforts that, that um, so the, the folks that are making the decisions about um, allocating resources you know, are shielded from sort of those uh, factors that may come into play um, with bias. So um, they wouldn't be providing that information in a patient report for assessment in terms of whether somebody would receive um, a particular resource. So when the resource is um, when the patient is being reviewed as far as whether they would be allocated a resource, that type of information would not be provided. Thank you. Okay, that, mm -hmm. that, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Representative Rogers. Thank you. Um, I wanted, I guess, to speak and hear a little bit more about the idea that risk factors can be a factor, but race and disability can't. And to me, I, I'm trying to understand how these two ideas are compatible because although I don't think we've seen Vermont specific data, we know on a national level that race is really strongly correlated with risk factors and that yeah. it's systems of injustice that create this correlation between race and risk factors. So to then include a risk factor as a part of a determination when this risk factor could be something that is based on race or disability. I guess I, I guess I would like to hear more about how those two concepts will be separated and then just to to kind of share that it seems it seems you know important to be working on not just taking away the view of race, but really institutionalizing a system that is just given all of the history that is associated with, with discrimination in healthcare for, for people of different races and, and people with disabilities. Yeah, that's great. That's a, that's a really good point and a great question. And I think that really what it comes down to is really looking at the clinical presentation of the patient and, um, you know, and recognizing that, you know, there is additional chronic disease burden um, in marginalized communities, but really looking at that individual patient and their clinical presentation and, you know, their, you know, likelihood of, um, a good outcome is really what it comes down to. And so we don't want to have um, race in and of itself be a factor that somebody considers when, or a team considers when they're looking at allocating resources, but rather looking at some of those validated metrics, like I mentioned, um, their prognosis and, um, uh, and, uh, treatment response, projected treatment response based on the severity of, of their underlying conditions. <laughs> so rather than saying, you know, rather than um, looking at race, sex, all of those things, or looking at somebody having a particular diagnosis. So you don't want to automatically exclude someone with a particular diagnosis. Um, rather, you would look at their individual um, health status and their likelihood of um, a good outcome. Yeah, th thank you. I appreciate that. I guess I would just say 
um, kind of as a comment, at least looking looking through a national lens, I could certainly see that 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 there could be a quite large effect of a bias towards treating white people if there was a conscious effort at treating people who would be more likely to survive with understanding that there's underlying risk factors coming from social conditions that may truly be making people of color less likely to survive. And I, I'm just, just a, I think it sounds like you have a, a, a lot of consciousness of that as well, but I just wanted to say that through, through an, uh, when applied to a national scale, I could definitely see yeah. large systemic problems with, with that right. approach. I, I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, Representative Thank Donahue. Um, uh, thank you. I guess I'll, I'll ask my second question first because it cropped up in the context of a, an earlier question. And, and that goes back to the effect of implicit bias and the discussion was around the, the you know, teams making decisions um, about limited resources. But that all um, gets initiated presumably because a doctor is making a request saying my patient needs a, a ventilator um, and you know, there aren't enough. So then it goes through that process. But the starting point is the individual who's making a decision as to whether to uh, whether that uh, need is valid for that patient versus a decision that that patient um, has a less good potential for clinical out outcome. And right at that level, there could be a significant role for for um, unrecognized bias even in that initial decision, is there any part of the process that um, looks at that uh, decision-making point in the, in the beginning of the triage system? Yeah, well, I think that, um, again, the, um, those validated metrics, that would be where that would come into play. And also, I think, you know, when a patient is at the point of needing a ventilator, they're being treated by a team of people. Um, so it's not one individual provider who's making that decision. There are a lot of people on the treatment team who would be involved in that patient's care. And so, um, you know, there would be um, a, a team decision at that level as well, which I think would be driven by, again, those validated metrics and their clinical presentation. Okay, thank you. My, my original mm -hmm. question... Uh, goes back to the, um, I know that you said that the new, the new guidance is uh, still in draft, so uh, you may not be able to answer this yet if it's still being um, developed um, un until it's final, but um, you kind of ran through some of the, the factors and, and of course that's not the final wording, but I've seen, I've seen a list of what the healthcare advocate was was advocating for as a, a stronger and more complete list. Do you have a sense for how much of that is being adopted or if some of it is not? Because it did include some factors that you didn't reference um, when you were listing some of the draft items. Yeah, I'm so, I apologize. I don't know the answer to that question, but I can um, certainly um, take another look at the draft and, um, and and see where that is. I apologize, I don't know. Okay, yeah, that would be helpful to know because that it included more detail on some of the ones you referenced and then also included um, health insurance status, socioeconomic oh, yeah. status, things like yeah. that. Yeah, health insurance status and ability to pay for care, socioeconomic status, profession or other social factors, those are in the current draft. Okay, good. In addition the one I mentioned. Okay. I apologize, I didn't call those out specifically. Good question. Uh, Representative Lippert. And then uh, I think after that, we'll move on to Cindy Brzezzi. <clears throat> so as I'm listening, um, so my question really has to do with how 
such a policy that we're talking about now and somewhat we're talking about it somewhat um, theoretically because in fact at this point in Vermont fortunately uh, access to ventilators is not a pressing issue apparently at least that's that's our general understanding although just a few weeks ago it might have become one and we were and so I'm, I'm it's very appreciative of the efforts to really revise a policy and have a policy in place but as I'm listening, I'm, I'm thinking of images I've seen, again, in the media, uh, New York hospitals, uh, places filled with patients on ventilators. And I'm thinking, how realistic is it that in the middle of an actual crisis where you're having to make an allocation decision that there's going to be, well, that's stop and have a committee of people gather and help me figure out what to do as opposed to what do we do now because in fact we have these patients here and we do not have enough well in this case ventilators or another case it might be some other medical equipment or something else i'm just help me understand how this policy actually fits in the real world of crisis medicine and management Right. Um, so I think that as someone becomes hospitalized, um, and just for full disclosure, I am not um, a medical provider, but, um, but when someone is hospitalized, and particularly if their condition is deteriorating, I think that before someone was at the point where, wow, we need to vent this patient now, um, that would be part of the planning before the patient got to that point. Um, and so um, I think that people would be thinking ahead in terms of, um, of planning for potentially a patient needing a ventilator. And it's really, um, I didn't want to give the impression that, you know, it's a long process that someone would need to go through in order to uh, procure a ventilator for a patient. So if, um, if there's a ventilator that is, you know, at the actual facility where the person is, which, you know, ideally that would be the case, then, you know, there would be, um, you know, their medical team would make that decision. If there wasn't one that was available nearby, then, um, then there would be a process for them to procure the ventilator um, uh, through another facility. Um, and those decisions can be made very quickly, particularly when, um, like I said, folks are thinking ahead in terms of this particular patient's likelihood of needing a ventilator and their clinical presentation. And um, it's not sort of like this panel that needs to meet per se. Um, I think that, that the decisions can be made uh, quickly. I don't know yes, if that answers. Yes, your I question. guess I'm left still not at all clear how this actually works in the real world uh, because I think that, anyway, I, I guess let me put it a different way. I think what might be helpful for me at least would be at some point, and after we hear from Cindy, maybe some things will be clearer as well, but I think it'd be helpful for us to hear from some medical professionals uh, about the actual application of crisis uh, standards of care and to hear whether and if they've actually been implemented in Vermont at any point along the way over the, period, over the past number of years and, you know, have they worked? Uh, have they been useful or is this does it end up being an exercise which we need to have and should have? But uh, I'm, I'm struggling with understanding how this actually uh, integrates with an actual medical crisis situation. Right. Okay. Well, and the, with respect to the ventilators, the decisions um, in the draft plan that I mentioned, um, what's stated in there is that the decision is made within 30 minutes. Um, but in reality, if there, you know, if there is a shortage and a ventilator is not available at that particular facility, and maybe it needs to be procured from a facility that is a couple of hours away, that presents some logistical issues. But, um, 
so the plan does take into account the need for um, an expeditious decision. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. But I, I, again, I would still suggest at some point we hear from medical professionals who are directly involved in having to be involved, make so, these decisions. Uh, th that's a that's a really good idea. I'm, but I'm I'm loath to try to find someone who's working on COVID right now. No, I'm not suggesting. <laughs> that. Yeah. So, um, and and I think that a number of folks um, uh, are familiar with the crisis response and have lived through some of these. Uh, I personally have seen uh, uh, someone close to me living through some of these crisis decisions and it's, uh, it's extremely stressful, but it, it, but it seems to work. So we will move on to Cindy Brazese and um, Kelly, I wanna thank you for the time um, and the information that you provided us. And uh, as things go forward, we may wanna hear more about um, how the crisis policy is um, is unfolding. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And so Cindy, welcome. And thank you for being here. I had to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> trying to get in the, in the habit of muting and unmuting. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, for the record, I'm Cindy Brzezzi. I'm the executive director and clinical ethicist at the Vermont Ethics Network. Um, by way of full disclosure, I'm also a clinical ethicist um, for the University of Vermont Medical Center, so I do clinical time there, and I chair the ethics committee for the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, just so that folks know the different various hats that I wear in my role at the Ethics Network and beyond. So I, in uh, listening to Kelly, she did a great job of giving you an overview, and there may be a little bit of redundancy and perhaps maybe a little clarification. Um, in regard to what she spoke about and what I was planning to speak about as well. I did prepare a few slides, which um, I sent to Nellie this morning, which I think might be useful. Um, I'm happy to go through those. I think Nellie's, we can either have her, you know, share the screen and we can all look at them together or um, whatever is your pleasure. I'm happy to do that. I think it might just provide a little bit of background in terms of the ethical framework for how we go from what we normal operating standards of care to the shift we have to make um, when we're in this kind of altered reality that we all seem to be living in and what tensions that creates. And I think a lot of you who have asked questions have already kind of are recognizing the tensions that exist. So I, I guess I would say if ever there was a time to be an ethicist, a pandemic certainly does um, bring about the, uh, the need for these kinds of things. And, and I will say that as, as much as I have training in clinical ethics, I think all of us that do this work, none of us feel like we're experts in allocating peers resources. Like this is the one thing we all are hoping to avoid. And, and I would say the last six weeks has been very much probably for you, just like for me, Feel like I'm drinking water from a fire hose in terms of trying to, you know, wrap my brain around the experiences that are that we're hearing about across the globe, and what we can learn from those and apply so that we can um, be as responsive as we need to be. So I am by no means an expert um, when it comes to pandemic. Uh, allocation of scarce resources. I don't think any of us are, which is probably a good thing because we, we don't find ourselves here very often. Um, so Nellie, uh, does it make sense, um, Madam Chair, that we share a screen and, and go through these slides? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, to I was just gonna ask, Nellie, is it possible to get the slides, um, Cindy slides up on, our, on your screen for us? Uh, yep, that's absolutely possible. I've got them pulled up now and can uh, okay. share screen whenever. Go ahead. Uh, oh, perfect. Terrific. Great. Thank you. So um, this is the title slide. Nelly, you can move to the next slide if you would. Um, I think it's really important to just kind of orient ourselves to what we normally are doing and what we are kind of thinking about doing when we shift 
to more of a public health focus. So normally when we are doing patient care, we are really focused on an individual patient. Like everything is very centered on the patient. We are there purely to think about how do we promote health and wellness and restore someone's function. We're focused on alleviating suffering and really emphasizing aligning the care that we're delivering with the goals, preferences, and priorities of individual patients. So this is sort of our ethical obligation under normal circumstances. This is how we are operating and should be operating. When we start to think about a public health crisis, all of a sudden our normal way of operating has to shift and we need to think more about the community at large, the safety of the public, how we are equitably and fairly allocating resources that may become scarce and limited. And we still have obligations to respect um, individual people, but we have to look at um, like sort of the moral equality of all people, right? So we're not just focused on the individual any longer. And this is this does start to create attention for individual healthcare providers. And I think for the public, because they're accustomed to a different way of having care delivered. And we're, we're basically saying, we're gonna be doing things differently. And this feels challenging for providers and for patients alike and family members. Can you go to the next slide? So there are some guiding principles when you think about developing these types of standards, these altered standards when there's a public health crisis. First, we think about fairness and what, are, what we are obligated to do and to recognize um, that we are doing things in a way that will be fair to the people who are affected by those decisions, communities, practitioners, organizations, um, and there's an evidence base to the response that we are providing. We still have a duty to care. Um, our standards are focused on um, the duty of professionals to care for patients um, in need of care. So we're still looking at everybody's needs. We need to steward those resources equitably. And I think this is the big piece that makes it uncomfortable is that the focus has shifted from this sort of individual focus to a utilitarian goal, which is very uncomfortable for us to be just saying, listen, we're no longer focused on what individuals want. We are focused on maximizing the greatest number of lives saved possible. That feels quite different than what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's where some of the tensions exist. We need to be transparent in terms of how we're gonna make these decisions. So everybody knows what's going on and there's no surprises. Um, and we need to be consistent, and you spoke a bit about this already today in terms of how we're applying these standards across the population. And again, I think we'll speak more about issues of race and age and disability and how that comes into play or shouldn't come into play. But I think you've all highlighted the realities of the reason bias is implicit is that we're not always aware of, of what we bring to the table. And so how do we try to at least acknowledge that, make explicit statements about not um, including that, and then try to manage that effectively as we can. We also need to be proportional in how we're responding. So the level of infringement, I would say, on individual autonomy needs to be based on the scarcity of the resource. So if we're not, if we don't have an, a scarcity right now, we shouldn't be focusing on you know, limiting resources. So we need to make sure that what we're doing is proportional to where we are in the stage of emergency. And I think ultimately we have to be accountable. Um, individual decisions that are made, standards that are implemented, we need to make sure that we are protecting individuals to the degree that we can and we're accountable for what we've done. And we have retrospect retrospective review in terms of how we made decisions and we're altering those as we get new information we're saying oops wait we, we've now learned something new we need to modify our policy and be accountable to that uh, we can go to the next slide so again as i just wanted to focus um under usual standards it's all about autonomy i think we hear this all the time we really are are focused particularly so i think in this state on respecting the individual rights to make decisions to be self-governing and to listen to what people have to say. We're trying to maximize the benefit to each individual patient. We have obligations just to them primarily and first and foremost. I think it's also good to acknowledge that not all who can benefit um, 
who could benefit from treatment are able to access it right now. Even under the best of circumstances without crisis and COVID and other kinds of, of constraints, people are, people are denied access for a variety of reasons. Um, and we're aware of that. And those are sort of baked in inequities in our healthcare delivery system that an allocation system during crisis will not be able to correct for if we're following a utilitarian kind of calculus. Um, when we shift to a public health kind of model of healthcare delivery, we're now trying to focus more on the common good, maximizing the best, the greatest benefit for the most number of people. And again, not all who can benefit from treatment will receive it, but under this kind of a lens, the reason they won't receive it has to do with scarcity. That should be the way that the decision is made. So, but I, I still want to acknowledge that in an allocation plan like this, that's following a maximum lives saved type of calculus, um, it will be very difficult to correct for historic longstanding inequities in, and disparities in the way healthcare is presently delivered under the, under the best of circumstances. So it's uncomfortable, but I think it really, this highlights the fact that at some point, we, we still need to be able to address those inequities because we can't correct for them when we're in this kind of crisis level of care. Next slide. Because I work for the Ethics Network, as most of you know, I would be remiss if I did not point out the importance of advanced care planning, whether we are in um, crisis standards of care or generalized, you know, regular standards of care, there is always, it is always important, and I would say more so now, certainly we're seeing this at the Ethics Network, to focus on really understanding what people's priorities. We should be affirming people's goals and values. We should be doing this anyway, whether we're in crisis standards of care or not in crisis standards of care. We should be encouraging and supporting people in naming a healthcare agent and having a decision maker. And I think now more than ever, people are recognizing that something could happen that would leave them unable to make decisions for themselves. And do they have a clear advocate and agent that can speak on their behalf and be their advocate if and when that circumstances arises. Now we have an actual name for that circumstance. It could be COVID, but um, at any time we don't, there is no crystal ball, but we really should be promoting people in doing this. I think the focus really needs to be on what are people's priorities, helping them kind of identify those things and what matters most to them, particularly in the event of an acute or life-threatening illness, which COVID can be. So understanding what the priorities are and making sure we have a good awareness of that becomes critically important. The issue of code status, this whole resuscitation and DNR has been coming up a lot, I think, in the media and certainly um, feeding, I think, people's concerns that somehow if they have COVID, they'd automatically be considered to do not resuscitate. And that I just want to make sure people are aware that that is in no way um, anything that people are considering, certainly not in this state. I do think though, if people have gone through the process of having these orders put in place for themselves because they've identified um, that as a, as a priority for them, not want, wanting to avoid a resuscitation attempt, not being interested in having that type of aggressive invasive intervention. And we need to affirm that decision so we know that in advance and we can ensure that they, we, we are able to avoid that intervention and provide good goal concordant care. The last thing we would want is for someone who's made a decision not to have a particular intervention like a resuscitation or intubation to suddenly get that intervention because nobody bothered to affirm that that was their priority. Particularly when we know that intubation is one of those things and resuscitation that can aerosolize this particular virus and puts it at greater risk um, of spreading, the, spreading it. So we want to make sure that we know this in advance and we've affirmed that. I also want to point out that people who have these orders sometimes think, I have it because I don't think I'll need it for a long time to come. COVID suddenly makes them feel like, holy cow, this could happen to me tomorrow. Wait a minute. <laughs> I think I've changed my mind. Mm -hmm. People can always change their mind. So it's really important if someone has these orders that those clinicians are going back and saying, we just want to touch base and check in. And if this is still your wish, great, we wanna make sure it's honored. If you wanna change your mind, let's make sure we um, have that information front and center so we're doing the right thing. 
Um, I also think it's important that if priorities include, um, I think we've already covered this. So I just want to get that out in the in the forefront because there have been a lot of questions about it. Um, and I am the ethics network lady. So had I not brought up advanced directives, I think y'all would have been disappointed. <laughs> uh, next slide. Um, just getting into the whole concept of where we are. I think it's the way we look at it, certainly when I'm in my hospital mode is where we are, are we in terms of our capacity to meet the need? So there's conventional capacity, which is how we are doing things normally. Ordinary use of resources, we've got enough space, we got enough staff, we got enough supplies and we're just delivering the standard of care. Then we get into sort of contingency mode, which is I think is where we've pretty much been <laughs> in Vermont for quite a while. Well, it seems like a long time. I know it hasn't been that long. Where we've got sort of a disruption in the way we're normally doing things, but on a functional level, we're pretty much equivalent to doing things the way we usually do. Um, we may be doing things like conserving, canceling elective procedures, creating more capacity for ventilators should we have a surge. We've been doing that. We've been, there are no elective procedures happening. We've been preserving our PPE because we know there's been a shortage of adequate PPE. So we've been trying to do things slightly differently, but we're still seeing patients and providing care. We're substituting things. We're doing telehealth instead of in-person clinic appointments, but we're still seeing those people. We may not be face-to-face -face with them, but we still are getting care to people and doing the best we can while trying to continue to you know, promote and protect public health. Um, and we're adapting some of the things that we're doing by cleaning PPE or reusing it as some examples. But right now we've been pretty much operating in sort of this contingency capacity mode, trying to expand our ability to respond if there's a surge, but continuing to provide for the most part the standard of care, just maybe in a slightly different way. When we get to crisis capacity, which luckily we've done such a good job in our contingency mode, we have not actually been in crisis mode, which is a wonderful thing. Um, when we get there, that's when we're talking about a really a brand new normal in terms of how we're going to be delivering care when we know that we don't have enough to meet the demand. So I just want to orient people to that sort of lens so that you, everyone feels that they have a good sense of where we are right now. Uh, next slide. When we get to that sort of uh, there we go. When we get to this kind of triage mode, and that is where we're really trying to identify those who are least likely to survive, regardless of treatment. These are people that do not, we are, we are not hopeful that there is a good outcome here. And we want to determine, um, oh, and the next piece is, is that patient likely to improve enough so that they could leave the acute care setting? Um, and that they're able to perceive the benefits of the treatment that we are giving. Um, this is what triage is. And I think my professor who, in my ethics training, um, she's, I don't know if you can see Dr. Rosamond Rhodes, uh, she sort of put out these slides as we've been, I mean, this information. And one of the things she said that really stuck with me when it comes to triage is that what this is about is about avoiding the worst outcome when we know a bad outcome is inevitable. This is what triage is about. It is not comfortable and we know that we are not gonna be able to meet the need of everyone who is deserving of a resource. And so there will be bad outcomes and people will feel bad about it, um, but there is no alternative because there's no resource to provide to everyone who is in need. That is what triage is, which is why it's very uncomfortable for clinicians and patients and families, because this is just not something we are used to dealing with at all. Um, but I think it's important to keep that at the back of our minds because that is what we're doing when we're in this crisis mode, which is why it's been so phenomenal that we've been able to do so much to build capacity within um, our state and I think in, in even the region so that we aren't here right now. This is not where we're at. Um, I think I just, next slide. I just want to stress that if and when we get to this kind of a level of crisis, I think you, it's important to recognize that healthcare providers are going to continue to consider the preferences of individual patients, but they will need to prioritize the community when resources become short. If that happens, 
important to recognize that they will continue to care for patients. Just because someone doesn't receive a ventilator or treatment does not mean we do not provide the care that they are, well, they are entitled to and deserving of. We will continue not just to care for them, but to care about them, their families with appropriate bereavement support and social and psych psychosocial supports that we can provide and to make sure that we are doing our best to make sure they have access to good palliative and comfort and supportive care services. So I think it's really important to stress that we're at, we may be focused on ventilators and, and those kinds of things, but we're still caring about all patients and trying to meet all of their needs. Um, even when we can't provide a particular resource that we wish we could provide. Next slide. And then this is just stressing this whole utilitarian calculus. And I think you can skip to the next slide because I think this is probably more in alignment with what Kelly was speaking about. Mm -hmm. We get to the point, and I'll use the ventilators as, a, as an example because I know there had been some questions about that. There is this kind of notion of trying to do this in a fair way. And I say trying to do this in a fair way because I think you guys have all pointed out that there are lots of things we're not gonna be able to control for even though despite our best efforts. But our goal really is this approach that's consistent, that is impartial and neutral when it comes to decision makers. So those triage teams should not be the same people who are giving direct care to the patient. So that allows that individual physician to advocate as they want to and should for their individual patient, but it removes the decision from them for having to make that allocation. So those triage teams should not be the same people that are caring directly for the patients involved. Um, we wanna make sure we're incorporating current accepted medical practice standards. So we're continuing to revise those as we learn more about COVID and how it presents and what its trajectory is. We wanna integrate that information into decision-making respecting the dignity of all patients, allowing for an appeals process, being transparent, and again, revising, as you just heard from Kelly, just as the state's doing, as we get more information, we update and revise our protocols and procedures to be the most current possible. This, I think, is the list that someone was asking about in terms of factors that cannot be considered. Um, this is a more, um, I think, inclusive list. And at the latest iteration, I think they wanted to add something that had to do with incarcerated individuals as well. Another population that um, has the potential to be sort of biased against. Um, and we want to make sure that at least we can include language that is explicitly states this is not to be included. Someone may be incarcerated and uh, an incarcerated person, but when they enter the hospital, they're a patient like everyone else and cannot be, that piece of their life cannot be and should not be considered. So this is, a, I think, a more inclusive list, but it doesn't have the incarcerated um, inmate um, population yet, but I think that is also going to be added moving forward just to be as explicit as possible. So hopefully this gets at that broader list, I think that um, Representative Donahue had asked about previously. So you can go to the next slide. When we get to this whole idea of <laughs> how do we allocate the ventilator when we're in this crisis mode, and I think you started to talk about this a little bit, um, at this point, and this is being sort of discussed, I'd say, across the country as to whether or not there should be inclusion and exclusion criteria. Currently, certainly in the UVM Health Network policy um, and the state's draft, we do have criteria for inclusion and exclusion when it comes to a ventilator. Um, part of this is to make it a little bit quicker, and I think that gets to Representative Lippert's point, like how do we quickly start to assess who's going to get something when we know time is short, and clearly people can't go for a long time if they're having trouble breathing. So we want to quickly assess, and this is, this is where the expertise of those ER docs and clinicians, those critical care physicians and clinicians, comes into play. This is their wheelhouse. This is what they do all the time, dealing with people who are in crisis and who are in have emergencies. Um, <clears throat> so we want to assess them in terms of the need for invasive ventilatory support and the evidence that they, they need to that they actually need a ventilator that that they can't they can't go without. Um, we do have a very short list of exclusionary criteria, and I think this has to do with really being able to quickly assess when you, there isn't a lot of time if you've got multiple people. And again, we're in triage mode, so we're not doing this now. I just want to stress we are not doing this right now. Um, all of it is really focused on the clinical indicators. So if there's a severe trauma and, and the clinical um, assessment is that there's poor outcome that's expected with, with or without treatment, this is, this is not going to go well. Severe burns, 
um, an unwitnessed cardi um, cardiac arrest, metastatic malignant disease, not in and of itself, but one that has, is, has expected to have a poor response to therapy, and any coexistent and end-stage failure of a major organ with a poor prognosis. So you could have end-stage kidney disease, but that doesn't mean that you're excluded from um, receiving a ventilator. It just means if there's a poor prognosis and you're not doing well. So these are um, some of the criteria that people would look at first when they're triaging someone who's coming in. Um, right now, this is definitely all subject to change, and we've even started to have some discussion about the language and whether it's really inclusion or exclusion criteria, or if we're really talking about, let's take a first pass look on these particular indications to see what that means. So I, I'm not sure that we're going to even stick with this language of criteria mm -hmm. exclusion, because I think it signals you're automatically out, and I don't think that's really what's intended. I think it's like a first screening to see who is, um, when, when there's not enough resources, who is most likely to benefit, keeping that, that's our fundamental goal. You can go to the next slide. And then we get to this sort of validated metrics that Kelly referred to a little bit. And this is that SOFA score. This is that sequential, uh, modified sequential organ failure assessment that those clinicians, those experts in doing the, the clinical assessment are gonna be looking at. These are the five sort of variables that they're going to be scoring someone on. And again, this is an attempt to keep it as objective as possible. So they're looking for various different measurements, whether it's through labs, assessments of their breathing. Um, they're looking for these objective criteria, and each patient would be scored based on these objective criteria. After you get the score, you can go to the next slide. Um, you're then put into a prioritization category, which is about whether or not you meet the criteria to get the resource that is limited. So if you end up with an, an MSOFA, in this instance, lower um, a lower score means you have the highest chance of surviving without treatment. So for people that have a really low score, they're likely not gonna get the ventilator because the clinical assessment is that they're probably gonna be okay without it. So we can save their life without, without utilizing the resource. People that have a very are on the completely other end of the spectrum. These are the people that have the low, the highest SOFA score and the lowest priority um, and the lowest likelihood of surviving even with the treatment. So if, since we're in triage mode and we're trying to maximize the most lives saved, and we know we only have a limited number of mechanical ventilators to do that, we're gonna, we're gonna people will be prioritized out of that resource if they don't need it, because they can survive without it, or if their condition is so poor that even with the resource, we are not expecting a good outcome. And then everyone else that falls kind of in the middle, these are the folks that are prioritized to get the, to get the resource. So they'd have a SOFA score in the four to seven or eight to 11 range, the four to seven as the highest priority, because we're probably thinking, they can, use the, they can use the ventilator maybe even for a shorter period of time, which means it frees it up for another person. And then the intermediate priority area, which is um, they could use it and we're, we're gonna continue to reassess. So I think that's probably, um, that's the end for me in terms of slides. I just wanted to orient you to some of what's in these protocols and how those decisions are being made. Um, and we have a lot more information we've been putting up on our website daily <laughs> about um, allocation protocols to try to give folks a sense of how this process will work and to reiterate what Kelly was saying earlier that these are ongoing and evolving decisions as we learn more information. Wow, thank you. We just had a graduate level everything. Uh, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, we have a lot of questions. We've got, uh, I've got four hands up and then I'll ask, I'm saving, I'll save mine for last. I don't mind. Um, we have, I'll read the names off that I have right now. So it's Representative Donahue followed by Senator McCormick, followed by Representative Chena, followed by Representative Page. So uh, Representative Donahue, um, you're up. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, um, there was a reference 
earlier, I think um, it may have been before you initially, um, that this is guidance, guidelines. Um, and then since you referenced, um, these are the, the UVM network um, has these. To what extent are all of our Vermont hospitals adopting them or using the guidance versus having sort of their own policies that might vary slightly? That's a great question. Um, we started working on these policies obviously months ago and, and some you know subsequent procedures. We've, um, I facilitated two meetings with um, all of our hospitals through the UVM Health Network. Um, they have a weekly case conference. And so we, we wanted hospitals to call in to see how people were doing and to try to share information that was being developed at UVM and for the UVM Health Network, which as you know, includes um, three Vermont hospitals as well as three New York hospitals. Um, and then to sort of get a sense of where people were, what questions they had and how they were looking at their policies. So right now, many hospitals are kind of, they started looking at the UVM Health Network policy and are have made some modifications. Because as you can imagine, when you're a big tertiary care center and you have lots of staff, <laughs> how you can do things looks pretty different than if you're a small critical access hospital with far fewer um, ex experts and, and staffing. So they've made some modifications, but right now we don't have one consistent um, protocol, if you will, across every hospital. That is something that we're in the process. I mean, and I think we're fortunate because we actually have time um, to then go back and to start to talk about where there may be some, um, differences uh, between from one policy to the next. But I think in general, the goal would be in a small state like Vermont, that we would want all hospitals hopefully to be able to be at a place where we're using the same sort of construct for how we would be allocating resources. And then I think there's the practical reality that Representative Lippert was talking about earlier which is how do you operationalize this in real time <laughs> to make sure that it's functional? And I think that's where we, we don't have all the answers to those questions yet. And, and I feel grateful, um, incredibly grateful that we've done such a good job of building capacity. So we now have more time to really think that through and try to get to a place where we have a more unified approach. I, my guess is I haven't seen every, every individual hospital's plan. So I can't speak with any authority in terms of where or if there's very large differences. Based on the couple of um, meetings we've had, I think there are some minor differences that are sort of um, individual to individual communities that we probably do need to work through, but I don't think they're, they're really substantively huge. And my guess is we will get to a place where we're all kind of looking at a similar way of doing things. Thank you. Stand by. Senator McCormick, you're up. Thanks. Um, I, I'm tired of the cliche, the elephant in the room. Let's say the hippopotamus <laughs> in the room is um, the question of, of how many years uh, a patient has to lose. Uh, it's, it would be presumptuous for one old man to claim to speak for old people in general. So speaking only for myself, I know that if I died today, I would lose somewhere between zero and 10 years, statistically. If my granddaughter died today, she'd lose 50. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to me that it, it's humbling uh, to think, but um, uh, I think her life is worth more than mine. And what do we include that at all? So that's a great question. And um, part of the conversation I'd say across the country and the bioethics listservs that I'm on has been just about that is do we factor in short-term survival, long-term survival, and do we factor in quality year, like life years? That's another metric that you could look at. And um, right now there's not been any discussion about kind of using that particular metric within the Vermont framework. I think there are other frameworks that are out there across the country that have an element of life years, but and I think there's they've for the same reason that people object or it feels weird to say, well, based on age alone, that would be a criteria to um, exclude someone. Um, you're what you're you're saying, yes, that's maybe true, but there's, you know, 
80 year olds who are hiking the long trail every single year who probably have a better cardiovascular respiratory health than some 30 year olds who spend every single day sitting on the couch. So, I mean, you know, I think again, trying to be more objective and to focus on short term survival, this is triage and really trying to be fair about that, that this is not about you know, someone's social worth, someone's number of years lived, any of those things. It's really more about can we save the most lives right now and get people in out of the hospital and living independently. So right now, we are not in Vermont that I'm aware of factoring in that type of a metric, um, but it's not to say that that metric hasn't been discussed in other policies across the country. Thank you. Um, Representative China. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to thank you both for um, such level of detail you've provided us. Uh, we had asked some questions about this topic a few weeks ago, and it's really um, gratifying to, to be provided with this level of detailed testimony about this important issue. Um, and it seems like there's been a lot of thought that goes into ed the educational aspect of teaching people and you know both providers in the community about the process and, and there's administrative support provided to people. But something that I didn't see that I wanted to ask more about was the emotional component. Because when we are, as humans, when we are in these situations, you know, we can be prepared, our rational, I, I'm a psychotherapist and a clinical social worker, so bear with me on this, you know, but we talk about the wise mind as the intersection of the rational mind and the emotional mind. And like from the wise mind, we make our best decisions. And so there's a lot of work here around the rational piece, like giving people guidelines and criteria and sort of a lot of structure to think within. But then when we're in that moment, there's a massive emotional impact on us as humans. And you mentioned some of this about how we will still care for patients, even, even when we can't give them a ventilator. Um, and I'm curious, sort of what kinds of support is being provided for staff around emotional support around preparing for possible crisis? And also what kind of emotional support is, is available for providers when they go through this, like after they lose patients through this kind of process? Um, so if mm -hmm. you could just say a little more about about that piece? Sure, well, I think we're starting to recognize, um, we, even though we haven't been in a situation where we have um, had uh, a lot of the crisis happening right now, being socially isolated is creating many of the same sort of stressors that you're talking about. And even the visitation policies, the fact that in order to prevent disease, we've had to restrict or limit it completely um, visitors to, to the healthcare system, to the hospitals and to nursing homes. and and that is creating a huge amount of stress and anxiety and moral distress, not just for patients and families, I think for staff too, particularly if someone is approaching end of life and they're really, you know, these are difficult, difficult decisions. I know on one of my board, we have a chaplain on the Vermont Ethics Network board, um, and he's been spending a lot of time supporting staff within his hospital where he works um, and patients and families. And, and he said he finds himself doing things like he was helping with the, the curbside testing. So he was just trying to be a sort of a source of calm and reassurance for people um, in a crisis time. So many of our hospitals have chaplains, chaplains and chaplaincy programs. So those people I think are being deployed to support folks. We have excellent bereavement support with our home health and hospice, hospice system who are still seeing patients and families. Um, and I think, you know, just a plug for home health and hospice, because one of the beautiful things about that program is that bereavement support is provided for up to a year after an individual dies, which is a lot of support for, for families in that instance. Um, we have this, the EFAP programs within hospitals that are there to support staff. We have palliative care services who part of what they do also is to provide that emotional psychosocial support for staff, patients, and families. So. I think, you know, in the first, in the early, um, like the first month when we were kind of really ramping up thinking we went, we might hit a surge, a lot of the focus was on the information that's already just been provided. I think now that we're seeing we've got a bit more time, um, we just started talking about trying to expand the resources that we have on our website and that are available to folks to focus more on kind of the emotional tool, but just kind of being in this level of uncertainty for this level of time. Um, is taking on folks and to try to, to, you know, reach out and make sure that we're we're providing resources to that end. 
It, this is Kelly. I was I was actually able to re, to join the Zoom by restarting my browser. But um, if I could just add to that with respect to healthcare providers, um, as you may be aware, we recently uh, the health department launched Vermont Health Link, which is specifically a substance use. Uh, resource website and call center to connect people with substance use information and support and to connect people directly with treatment. We recently, in partnership with the Department of Mental Health, um, applied for and received an emergency COVID grant from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, uh, specifically in response to COVID to address mental health and substance use. And one component, one activity we're funding through that grant is to uh, use Vermont HelpLink as a referral source for mental health and substance use services, specifically for healthcare providers to connect them to mental health services because it traditionally wasn't used just for mental health services. So um, we just, the grant just went through joint fiscal earlier this week. And so um, it will be at least another month before we have this up and running, but um, we'll be marketing that availability to healthcare providers um, in, the, in the coming months. So that will be another resource for them. Oh, thank you, Kelly. That that's very helpful. I did see that grant, and I think Senator Cummings and Senator Westman also saw it. And I, and and Representative Lippert. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it because it, it just it just in the in the overwhelming uh, billion dollar grants coming from the federal government around COVID, uh, the two million dollar grants seem. I mean, in any other time, it would be a large grant, and it just kind of like oh, and now we have this two million dollar grant. But I think it's. I'm very glad to see you. it was a. A grant that was sought out and uh, is being implemented. So, and I just a comment uh, further because uh, I think Representative China's question is a is a really important one. Um, and as we hear about, uh, we get the horrible news about the the healthcare provider in New York who took her own life, and apparently one of the reasons that happened was of the oh she was working too much. So, and I don't know whether um, there are any restrictions being placed on length of time that a physician or a nurse or other uh, caregiver are allowed to continue and stay in the hospital, e even during a crisis, uh, and I probably especially during a crisis, needing some time off. And so it, it, has that been taken into consideration in any of the crisis policies that uh, you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. That's a great question, though. I just I'm, I don't really have any ability to to respond to that with any kind of information. Sure. At this time. Uh, but it is. I'm I not think, aware of anything either. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, we ask people to work uh, extensive hours might be on 36 hours and off 12. That, that's the old days. And I don't know whether that is something that happens in a crisis. So um, it, might be something to look at in this context. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Page, you have a question. Yes. Um, in your um, briefing, you, you discussed a healthcare agent, I guess, uh, an advocate, I guess, for, for an individual patient. And in most cases, it's probably a family member that's uh, um, doing that chore and probably not, in, in some cases, not the best choice for the patient. I was curious, um, in Vermont, do we have uh, training for that and do we have certification uh, for that and, and how, how do we compare with other states uh, for uh, that particular position? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, so a healthcare agent uh, used to be called a durable power of attorney for healthcare in Vermont until we updated our statute in 2005. And now we, we refer to these folks as um, a healthcare agent. They're the individual that a person designates through an advanced directive to be the person who will be authorized to make decisions if they can't make decisions for themselves. We do not have formal training programs for people who are serving as healthcare agents. 
Although I will say we do a lot of education. I certainly do a lot of education across the state and my fellow um, <laughs> colleagues um, who we have a whole group now of what we call advanced care planning champions that are across the state working within their regions to really provide resources and education. Um, so we have a lot more material out there now for people who are serving as healthcare agents to support them in, in being able to ask good questions and understand what their job is and the decisions that they can make and the decisions that really are outside of the scope of a healthcare agent's authority. Um, and we do a lot of education with individuals who are contemplating completing these documents to try to help them think about who is a good person to be your healthcare agent. Um, I think you're right. Many people just assume or think, well, my spouse or the, my, someone that's close to me will, will be the right person. And sometimes that is the right person, um, but sometimes it's not the right person because maybe your spouse just needs to be able to be your spouse and doesn't want to be in the position of having to make difficult decisions. And so we try to help people think through those kinds of questions so that they, they can make a good decision for themselves. Um. In the case where a patient doesn't have an agent, doesn't have a family member, um, does the Department of Health step in with a particular agent assigned for that individual or, or what happens then? So in Vermont, we are unique. Um, so we, um, I'd say there's a couple of ways that that can happen. We do see individuals who do not have a named healthcare agent they just never got around to it. I didn't ask a poll, which I normally ask of all these committees whenever I come in, how many of you have an advanced directive, which I didn't ask, um, although I see some hands going up. Um, so first we try to identify, you know, having people do this upfront, um, but we do have some programs that are available to people who lose the capacity to make decisions for themselves. So the Office of Public Guardian is one avenue where we can get, um, these, are, these are public guardians, these are state employees that can be provided to individuals, but you have to meet a certain criteria in order to qualify for a public guardian. So you need to have, be determined to have a developmental disability prior to the age of 18, or you need to be over the age of 60 and unable to make decisions for yourself. And there are some financial criteria as well. So that does leave a pretty big donut hole, if you will, for people who aren't eligible for public guardians. Um, and so then, because we don't have a sort of default surrogacy law that's comprehensive in this state, we do end up needing to sort of cast a broad net and try to look for people who know this person. Um, we do have some, and who can provide what we call in our, in my world, substituted judgment, which is knowledge of the person's goals and values if they have it. We don't have that individual. The default is a best interest standard of care where we do what most people would choose with similar resources at hand. So it's not a perfect system for sure. We have an increasing number of, of individuals, which we refer to as unrepresented patients, so people who are actually quite alone in the world. Um, there are some services out there for private, for people who have resources for, you can like hire healthcare agents. Um, we have some people offering that as a business model. It's very limited. Um, but again, this is it's definitely a concern for people that don't have anyone. What we do recommend though, that even if you don't have someone you can name as your agent, you can still articulate your priorities and what is important to you and what your goals are. So, and those, because Vermont has one of the states that does recognize not just the designation of a healthcare agent, but they also recognize the, the preferences and priorities that people indicate in their advanced directive as something that also needs to be honored. So even if you don't have the person, you can, try to give guidance as to what your goals and values are, situations you're trying to avoid, things that you would find acceptable, trade-offs you're willing to make for more time, and that will be factored into the care planning decisions for those individuals. So that's the best we have at the moment. Thank you, thanks for that. I know it does complicate uh, decisions uh, in a crisis when they're a significant number of patients in dire straits. Um, I, 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 was, I was actually going to ask a question about advanced directives. I do know that um, House Human Services is taking testimony on advanced directives. And I'm, 
I'm interested in your comment about the fact that we don't have a solid uh, default surrogacy law in our state. And my question of you, Cindy, is, uh, is there anything that we can do given the crisis that we're in that might help? Um, we're, we're working on legislation uh, in our committee in the Senate and I know House Healthcare as well, we're here we are together. And then I've also talked with human services, but we're looking at um, legislation that might improve the process and treatment of patients during COVID. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if there is something to be gained by exploring a default surrogacy law at this time. So oh, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a big complicated, I mean, I think, sir, okay. the reason we haven't really tackled it as a broad <laughs> subject is because it's quite complicated. Okay. Um, we do have elements of surrogacy that exist oh, within the statute. Shoot. We have the ability for, um, a person with a known close relationship to the patient, so that is our sort of definition of surrogate, um, to consent for a hospice admission if the person doesn't have capacity. So we want to make sure that, you know, a family member who maybe hasn't been named in an advanced directive still could admit their loved one to hospice if they're dying and get them those services since um, hospice requires consent from someone. And if it can't be the agent, if it can't be the individual because they're too far progressed in their dying in their disease process, we, so we do have that element of surrogacy that exists. The other piece of legislation that was passed um, a couple of years ago is you did create a mechanism for um, surrogates to give consent for a DNR Colts order. So for committee members that don't know, DNR do not resuscitate Colts clinician order for life-sustaining treatment. These are portable medical orders. Um, so we do have a process um, and a framework now for People who are not an agent and not a medical guardian under a, under a probate court order um, who can consent for those orders on behalf of an incapacitated patient. So there is a framework for that now that exists within statute. So we do have some elements of surrogacy, but for all kinds of all other decisions, it's still a little bit um, open. Um, I will say though that um, I, as much as it's quicker, <laughs> I will say to look at a list and just be like, yep, that's the person, they get to make the decision. Um, and I think there's some, people tend to like that idea. I, I actually think Vermont does a pretty good job because we make sure that we are looking not just for the A person, but the right person, the person who actually knows this individual. So we still operate under the, under the sort of ethical standard of first, if we can't hear from the individual, personally, we want to know, we want to hear from someone who has knowledge of this person's goals and values. So a default surrogacy list isn't going to give us that, right? They're just going to be like, this is the person. Um, but we have, so we have to do some hunting. We have to cast a broad net. We have to talk to lots of people and figure out who out there knows this individual and can represent what they would say if they were able. And so I think that we're doing okay, even though we don't have this sort of default, we've got the, the, big sort of end of life elements covered and we're working hard, even though it takes more time. And I know some of my colleagues, my clinical colleagues would say, oh, just give us a list, it's so much quicker. <laughs> but I actually think we get to better decisions by taking the time to really figure out who knows this person well and can really offer us some evidence of what they would say if they were able. Thank you, thanks for that. So Will, and, and it is complicated and we don't need a complicated <laughs> Uh, piece of legislation right now. So we'll, we'll hold that thought, but I appreciate your input very much. Any other questions, committee, committees, plural? Representative Lippert. I would, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, and I wanted to take advantage of uh, your knowledge about advanced directives to remind us, if you would, of how, how it is that an, if an advanced directive has been completed, how it is that a medical professional uh, would actually be able to access an advanced directive and gain knowledge about what the patient's uh, advanced directive was in fr uh, who's, who's in front of them, um, particularly if absent the patient hasn't made that clear. Sure. Um, so one of the things that was really phenomenal that Vermont did, I think well ahead of most states in the country is we all created the Vermont Advanced Directive Registry. 
So we have, and it's been in place now since 2007, February of 2007 is when it went into effect. Um, I was just on the phone with the registry um, earlier this week. Uh, we have almost 48,000 Vermonters who have submitted their documents to the registry. We're averaging between 350 and 400 new registrants every month who are submitting their documents to the registry. It's not required, so it's still a, it's a voluntary process, but um, we do have more and more people doing it, especially now, because they want to make sure people have access. Um, and Vermont law actually requires hospitals to check the registry when a patient comes through the door who lacks capacity. So they have to look um, and see if they find a document and then they have obligations to honor that document to the best that they're, they're able. Obviously these documents don't always apply to the situation at hand. The other thing we do recommend is that people not only send a, doc, send a copy to the registry, they make sure they give copies to their healthcare agent, their healthcare provider, and the hospital where they're most likely to receive their care. And we have systems in place in all of our hospitals now where they're asking if you have a document and getting a copy immediately and getting it scanned into the record. So we're doing our best to try to make sure that there is access and in real time, not waiting for the bank to open because someone's got to go to the safety, you know, the safety deposit box to try to dig something out. Um, so that we have access to these in real time and we can do our best to respect the, the priorities and preferences that people have taken the time to, to share in advance. Thank you for that. Um, and I do know that, um, as I said, I know that Human Services is looking at this again, so uh, we may hear more. Uh, Cindy and Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time to present us with the very practical crisis policy, and then the very important background information that's needed as the policy is put in place, developed and put in place. I think you've both done an exceptional job. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing the final iteration from the <laughs> health department. And yep. we'll look forward to any further information that either one of you can provide uh, for us going forward. We are sure. at the end of our meeting today. We're still ahead of time. Um, Two whole minutes. I will say, our, yeah, we're, we're getting good. I have one last comment to make that is tomorrow morning. We are meeting jointly again. Uh, I think it's nine. Is it nine? That's what the agenda says, yes. Yep, from nine to 1030 with the House Committee on Healthcare. And then after that, um, when, you, when you folks are going off to session, uh, Senate Health and Welfare will have some opportunity for a discussion on some of the other things that we've been looking at recently. So thank you all. It, it's thank been um, another very important day for us and appreciate all your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Ending live stream.